Hi, my name is Eric Beard. Thanks so much for showing interest in learning a little bit more about the shoulder complex. We've got a lot of information to cover over this video and I appreciate you taking the time to go ahead and get a copy of this and watch it with me. There are some different names that I've tossed around for this and, and what I've noticed with names is you know they're great for marketing, they're catchy for marketing, or sometimes they just help you remember things. But this really is a precursor to a bunch of other information I put together on the secrets and staples of training the athletic shoulder. So what we're gonna go over today are 11 steps or 11 secrets or 11 components of a system that you must take into play, put into place when you're working with the shoulder complex. Um, if you already know me, then you know a little bit about my history and background. And if you haven't met me or been in one of my live workshops, I'd just like to take a few minutes to talk about myself and let you know who I am and kind of how I got here before we dive into the meat of the information. I've been in the health and fitness industry since 1996 and I've been a massage therapist since 1998. I was an athlete in high school and in college and always enjoyed exercising. One of the things that I had run into was some injuries. I was in a few car accidents. I had a disc injury in my neck. I had multiple shoulder separations. I had some, some chronic aches and pains when I worked out. Not a big deal for an athlete, right? Well, after a while, these things begin to compound and stack up on top of one of another. It, vividly, I can remember in the fall of 1996 in September, I had just gotten back to, to college after a long summer of lifting weights. It was a great summer of working out. I'd put on somewhere around 25 or 30 pounds of muscle. Uh, I was moving some good weight. I was warming up on the bench press. And I remember I had 315 pounds on the bar. And yeah, that was, that was part of my warm up. I was a little bit bigger then and definitely a little bit stronger. And I felt this, this vice like burn. It's like someone took a hot vice and put it right through here. And it just clamped down on that part. Of, it was on rep number three. So I got one no problem, two no problem, number three. My arm moved in. I just felt that. I finished that set. I put the, I put the weight on the rack. I kind of limped through the rest of the workout. Didn't really get much done. And that stayed with me for a while. In that season, that fall season, into my season of hockey, I ran into to two more separations on my shoulder on that left side. It, it was pretty painful. So as I look back and I think about the anatomy, it was probably Terry's major going into a spasm, but at the time I had no idea. It just meant hour upon hour in the training room icing my shoulder and going through senseless exercises that did nothing to help with my range of motion, strength, or pain. This kind of mirrored the rest of my athletic career, and I went through a period for about three years when I couldn't I took about two years off from working out because the cycle would be as I'd rest from working out, I'd ease back into it, my shoulder would hurt. I'd rest from working out, I'd ease back into it, my shoulder would hurt. That was pretty frustrating. And then I went through a period of about five years where I couldn't throw a baseball or frisbee without pain. It was brutal. I mean, luckily I wasn't a baseball player. I didn't play ultimate frisbee all the time, but it kept me from doing things recreationally that I like to do, and it drove me nuts. And I also went through a period of somewhere around, I counted out, it was about 1,800 days when I woke up in shoulder pain every single morning. I felt like I was 100 years old. It killed to wake up. And I was a side sleeper, so I'd wake up every day just like this, and I would be in such pain. Sometimes it was the bottom shoulder that hurt more, sometimes it was the top shoulder. It drove me nuts. And I went through a period of about seven years where my shoulder bothered me during each workout or after each workout. I remember when working as a fitness manager in Colorado at a prominent health club chain, someone was asking about what I did for workouts because I was probably another 20 or 30 pounds heavier than I am now. And so I was like, wow, how'd you, how'd you get so big? So I just, you know, I was telling about my workout. They say, how many set, sets of chest do you do? Well, I, I do chest until I can't lift my arm anymore. They're like, whoa, that's sick. You work out so intensely. You train chest so you can't lift your arm anymore arms anymore? I said, no, I train chest until I can't lift my arm anymore. I have a shoulder problem. So some days that would be three sets, some days it would be 10 sets. And it was the pain that would stop me from doing any more. It was getting old. I was getting cranky from workouts that I missed. And I had gone to massage therapy school during this time to learn more about helping other people as well as myself. And I was worried about my business as a massage therapist. I couldn't do some of the techniques without pain. So here I am, in my early 20s to mid 20s with my body failing, my business as a massage therapist in jeopardy, and these clients coming in with poor posture, aches, pains, and itises, experiencing a lot of the same things that I was. How can I protect my business? How can I protect myself? So I turned back into education. And over the years, I've invested over 6,270 hours in over $72,000 into learning about the human body through my undergraduate degree, through massage therapy, through my master's degree and credentials on top of that and throughout that. It's been a lot of time, and I've spent time studying the human movement system, especially the shoulder complex. Why do you think that is? Because my shoulders hurt all the time and I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do. So I was motivated to get out of pain and I was motivated to make sure that that never happened to anyone else. The exercises that I was given, the techniques that I was given, 
did almost no help. There was one technique that helped me, and it was an athletic trainer and my hockey team who was only assigned to us sporadically. He did a PNF technique on my shoulder. It was the only thing that helped my shoulder ever feel better through that whole course of time. Nothing else did much for me. And the other offering that I received was surgery, and I was going to do anything that I could to avoid that. So personally, my experience has driven me to learn more and kind of pass that on to other people because I don't want other people to have to deal with the pain and the chronic discomfort and the mood disruptions and missing out on the things that I like to do recreationally. I don't want anyone to have to go through that. And that, that's kind of brought me to this point, if that kind of helps you make sense. So right now, I work in the health club. I oversee a, a staff of personal trainers during the week. Uh, so not only do I practice as a massage therapist, I practice as a corrective exercise specialist. I work with some teams and groups, but I get to coach other folks. I also travel around the country and present to about a thousand health and fitness professionals every year on topics of personal training, corrective exercise, and athletic performance enhancement. So I'm lucky enough to work with people one-on-one -on -one and in groups, but I'm also lucky enough to coach a team live and in person, and I'm also lucky enough to travel the world, usually the country, but every now and then I get sent overseas to work with other people in this industry as well. It helps me grow, it gets me outside of my box and expand, and I hope that helps me get better at what I do, and that's conveying this information to you. I can't say that I made up this information, know what I try to. You know, most of us haven't. It's just a compilation of information. I can't even say that I've made up the order that this stuff is in. But what I have done is I've taken it in a way that's made sense to me, and hopefully I can explain it in a way that makes sense to you, where you look at the big picture and put it all together. There's so many, dif uh, so many different disciplines to learn from, and I've tried to draw from all sorts of them to try to give you some information and a leg up on the competition and to accelerate your rehabilitation, your conditioning, as well as that of your clients as well. And that's something I am very proud of. So I didn't make this information up. I might not have even made the combinations of information up, but to try to put it together and to deliver it in a way that works, that's what I hope to be able to do, and that's what I hope is unique. So, long blab about myself and this information, but we're going to cover about 11 secrets, 11 steps to a system, call it what you want, that you must take into consideration when training the shoulder complex. They are anatomy, assessments, tissue extensibility, joint, mo oh, I got to do four there, can I get uh, joint mobility, muscle length, neural activation, muscular strength and endurance, core training, integration techniques, acceleration working up to athletic preparation, and then the recipe. So for all you mad chefs in the house, the recipe of the program design. So those 11 steps, those 11 sections, we're going to give you an overview of today. Make sure you're paying attention to these in one way or another, whether you're working with someone that's in pain to prevent pain, enhance performance, get bigger or stronger, or just to have fun picking up their kids. All right, let's dive in. You know, the shoulder complex is a, a bit of a a bit of a conundrum. You know, there's, there's so many muscles that are involved around it, but not much joint stability, and, and, it's oft, and it's an oft injured area. It's something that we must pay attention to in any health, fitness, performance, or rehabilitation program. And if we look at some of the research that we've seen from NEAR, they've found that over 95% of the tears that they've seen in clinical practice were preceded by um, a condition called impingement. Almost everyone that came in that was diagnosed with a rotator cuff tear, at first, had some sort of impingement. So that's giving us a clue right there that if we've got impingement, that's a problem. So that's something that we must understand in our anatomy and our assessments. If someone has impingement, we must do something about that ahead of time before it turns into a problem. In Dutch practice, up to 25% of the people that have come in um, with, um, with a shoulder pain have ended up with a surgical intervention as well. I mean, that's pretty big. And about 25 of every thousand people to come in uh, to see a doctor that the complaint is about the shoulder pain. So it's a pretty big deal. And it can not only lead to acute pain in this area or chronic pain, but it can lead down to the elbow, the wrist, the neck, the low back, and throughout the rest of the body or through the human movement system. Or another way to think of that is the kinetic chain. So it's a very mobile joint that has a significant interrelation throughout the rest of the body. Think back to hundreds of years ago, if we didn't have the ability to use our upper extremity with a shoulder injury, we would be left behind. We would not be able to eat, hunt, farm, whatever it is that we had to do, and it could honestly mean our life. So the shoulder joint and the upper extremity is pretty important. So I'd mentioned before the human movement system, the kinetic chain, and that's the point that we must start on when we're talking about any component of anatomy. So the human movement system, or the kinetic chain, is made up of three distinct yet interrelated systems. We have our nervous system, our muscular system, and our skeletal system. The nervous system is a wondrous, wondrous component of the human body. 
and we oftentimes ignore this in general fitness programs, but we must understand its ro critical role that it plays in human movement and function. Sim simply, the, human, the nervous system takes in information, processes what to do with it, and then responds. If it does not take in the correct information, if it does not how to un understand how to interpret that, and it does not respond with the correct action, we are not going to get the result that we want from the movement. That's pretty important. Now, the muscles are what most people focus on in the health and fitness world, which is completely fine, but it's what we see on the outside. There's a lot more to it than that. Muscles can, pro they can produce tension and force. They can produce force. They can reduce force. They can dynamically stabilize force. They basically do what the nervous system has figured out and told it to do. So for our muscles, we must be able to produce force or shorten the muscles. We must be able to reduce force and lengthen the muscles eccentrically, and we must be able to stabilize force and hold isometrically. So we'll talk about all three components of a repetition, a concentric shortening, an eccentric lengthening, and an isometric stabilization. We must be able to do all three of those. And think about where you spend most of your day. Do you spend most of your day shortening your muscles, lengthening your muscles, or holding them still isometrically? What are you doing right now? Unless you're sitting on a foam roller or doing a kneeling hip flexor stretch, you're probably holding stale isometrically. But in most fitness and conditioning programs, do we pay much attention to the isometric contraction? Not enough. So that's an important part of human movements. We must focus on all different actions of the muscular system, and that's got a lot to do with how the nervous system recruits those muscles. We'll come back to the muscles a little bit more in just a minute or two. And then we have the skeletal system or articular system. So the bones give us internal framework. They give us structure and support, and they also give the muscles leverage. So as the brain tells the muscles what to do, the muscles pull on the bone to create an action. Now, you know, the bones, we fa we're fairly confident with that they're important, but if they're not lined up correctly because of our posture, then they're not going to move correctly. And if the joints don't move correctly, then the muscles cannot work correctly. And that means the nervous system is not going to get what it needs out of the whole deal either. So they are all interconnected. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those. And if you think about our posture, our posture is simply the alignment and the function of all three of these systems together. Posture is the linchpin to every performance, conditioning, or rehabilitative approach that you're going to take. You must have posture and alignment, whether it's static, whether it's dynamic, because posture will determine the alignment of the bones. If we have ideal alignment of the bones, what we're going to have is we're going to allow the joints to move correctly. If the joints do not move correctly, then some of the tissues in between the joints are sacrificed. What are some of the soft tissues that are in between two bones that make up a joint? That's right, I'm asking you a question. I can't hear you back, but I want you to think a little bit. What are some of the tissues there that create some cushioning? Cartilage, very important tissue, and that's one of the, mar the, 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 the marvels, of, that's one of the problems that the marvels of modern, modern medicine have not figured out yet, that once our cartilage is gone or degenerated, there's not much that we can do to bring it back. We can remove cartilage, we can sew up cartilage, but it's very difficult to regenerate that hyaline cartilage that gives us that nice, smooth surface around a bone. So we can end up with that grinding of the bones together, which can be extremely painful. So if our bones do not line up correctly, we end up with a wearing down of the cartilage, which I think we'll all agree is not a good thing. If our bones don't line up correctly, we're going to put stress on the joint capsules. Capsules are typically made up of ligamentous structures. Uh, ligaments can be thought of as rubber bands. You know, we stretch out a rubber band, it will pop back. When we stretch out a ligament, it doesn't snap back. It becomes permanently stretched out. So it's the difference between uh, taking something like a rubber band that snaps out and back and then, then Play-Doh. So you stretch out Play-Doh, it stays there. Or stretch out Silly Putty, it, snap, it snaps back. Play-Doh doesn't come back. So our ligaments, when they're permanently deformed, they're permanently deformed. And then, you know, we can have some repair. You can have them cut out. You can have them stitched together. You can maybe cut off part of your hamstring tendon and make another ligament. Or you can get one from a cadaver. All very attractive options, correct? Not at all. So the alignment of the joint keeps the integrity of the passive system, the cartilage, and the ligaments, as well as the, the tendons that hold the muscle in and around the joint together. I think we get the importance of that. So the alignment of the skeleton is critical. And I'd like you to think about some of these tissues that I just mentioned, because they do wear out over time as we age. How many of you have bought a new pair of sneakers somewhere in the last year? I would venture all of us. Now, some of you bought the new sneakers because they were cute or they went with your outfit or you had to have the latest and greatest thing, and some of you purchased them because the rubber on your sneakers or tennis shoe, depending on where you're from. I'm a sneaker guy from Massachusetts, right? The, because the rubber on your sneaker shoe wore out. 
your cartilage wears out, your ligaments wear out. So if you have your, your bones that are slightly off center, you're going to have an abnormal wearing of those tissues and they're going to wear out much faster than they would have if they were lined up correctly. So alignment of the skeleton is critical for the soft tissue around there. But the alignment of the skeleton has a massive impact on the function of the muscular system. I'm going to advance my little slide here. So when we're talking about the alignment of the, mus of the skeleton, skeletal system affecting the muscular system, I want you to think about a few concepts. You might have heard the term uh, length tension relationships. So if we think about the, a sarcomere or a muscle cell, you have these filaments, these protein filaments, the actin and myosin filaments. When a message is strong enough from the brain that's going to engage a motor unit, these actin and myosin filaments will bind onto each other and shorten the muscle. Now the more overlap or interdigitation that you have between the actin and myosin, the more force production that you can have. So if we have a muscle that's at ideal less resting length, there's going to be some overlap of these filaments. If we have a joint that's out of position and it leaves this muscle in a shortened position, much like you see if someone is on that mouse or doing the 10 key data entry with that right shoulder all the time with the pectoralis minor, for example, we leave that muscle shortened there's not as much overlap. They can't grab on, they cannot produce or reduce force equally well. So if you have a joint that's out of alignment and you have a short muscle, it will not be able to produce or reduce or stabilize force as well as it should because of the length of the muscle and the overlap of the fibers. Conversely, if you have a muscle that's lengthened, you're not going to have that overlap or interdigitation of the actin and myosin filaments. So in this scenario here, if we've got pectoralis minor that's shortened, then we have several other muscles in the back, like the lower trapezius, that are lengthened. And that lower trapezius just can't grab on. It can't get the overlap of the actin and myosin filaments. So the alignment of the bone is not only crucial to the tissues in between the joints and around the joints, but it's crucial to the function of the muscular system. Length tension relationships. If you have an ideal length of the muscle, you're going to have a better chance of having ideal strength. Strength and length rhyme together. Short muscle, not good at producing force or reducing force or stabilizing it. Long muscle, not ideal length equals ideal strength. And that's what we're shooting for. So the muscular system, skeletal system, that brings us all the way back around to the nervous system. Remember, the nervous system takes in information, processes it, and then decides what we should do. So the nervous system is getting the message that a joint is out of alignment. We have receptors within our joints that tell us what's happening at muscles, what's happening with tendons and cartilage and ligaments, and then it's not understanding what to do. So it might tighten up muscles around a joint to protect them, or it might recruit muscles um, that are synergist or helper muscles to bring you through a movement. That's synergistic dominance. I didn't have time to set up reciprocal inhibition. I mean, you can go for a whole mu human movement system presentation here, but I'm going to try to stay on track just a little bit. So that's the kinetic chain. All three of those systems are interrelated. Our posture is the alignment and function of those three. If our posture is off, the function is even worse. So if you've read my blog and you've seen some of the other videos that I've done, alignment and function dictates everything. And that's the first thing that you must understand. And specifically, as I come back over here to our, um, to our guy right here, our skeleton. I usually name my skeletons, but this is, this is from my friend, um, courtesy of Todd Foreman. By the way, if you like the walls, I'm um, here at Rebound Physical Therapy. Thank you very much to my friends at Rebound Physical Therapy for letting uh, me and my cameraman, I left a little shout out there, buddy, for hanging out here on Friday night and making this video for you. I'm going to put these guys in the credits, but they're very important for me. I appreciate the work that I love doing. I appreciate Rebound letting me come here, and I appreciate Todd Foreman from Integrative Therapeutics letting me use this fella. Now, I have a spine, but it's nowhere nice as this. This is fancy dancy, real deal. So, as we come back here and we think a little bit more about anatomy, We've got some good meat over here. I usually name my skeletons. I haven't named this guy. He's not mine. I want you to think about the shoulder complex. So lots of, lots of great stuff, but let's think here. Our eyes drawn in right to that blue right there with a nice contract to the background. We have our brachial plexus. We have the biceps tendon. We have uh, multiple aspects of the rotator cuff and their tendinous insertions onto the humerus. Many people think of this as the shoulder. But what you must understand with the shoulder complex, we also have the sternoclavicular joint. We also have the acromioclavicular joint. These joints articulate and move. As I spin around this beast right here, and I link it down into place, we also have the scapula, which forms that scapular thoracic joint or that fake joint. And we have the glenohumeral joint, or what most people think of as the shoulder. So when we're considering anatomy, we have all these joints, the sternoclavicular, the acromioclavicular, you have the scapulothoracic, and then you have the glenohumeral. But I also want you to think of 
the thoracic spine. This entire complex with all the tissue that's interwoven and molded on top of it makes up the shoulder complex. So if you're training someone's shoulder or you're training someone's hip, you must understand the interrelated nature of the body. We have muscles like the latissimus dorsi that run from this big band of connective tissue, that thoracolumbar fascia, from the sacrum to the crest of the ilium, to the lower thoracic spine, through the lumbar spine, to the, lower, the bottom two or three ribs, up to that inferior angle of the scapula, out to the humerus that runs massively through here. If you're training the hip, you're affecting the lat because of its attachment into the pelvis. And that's going to run up into the shoulder. So you must understand that posterior oblique subsystem, if you've heard that term, which are going to be the lat and the tissues that run obliquely from one shoulder to the, the gluteal complex, especially maximus that runs obliquely from this shoulder. The hip and the shoulder work together. You must understand the pit stops in, anatomically on the way, but you must understand globally that integrated function and how it matters. So when you're training the big foot, big toe, you're training the shoulder. Dysfunction in the shoulder can result from a restriction in the ankle. It can result from a restriction in the big toe. So all this stuff, knowing where the rotator cuff starts and ends, and taking that supraspinatus off right here, and you've got your teres major, and you've got your infraspinatus right there, you must understand that in the supraspinatus. You must get the basic nuts and bolts of the rotator cuff. Never mind the scapular stabilizers, but you must understand the big picture as well. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit more as we go today. So I know that we're giving the overview of all these 11 steps. We're just on number one. We're talking about the anatomy, and you must get the simplistic local function as well as the global function as well if you truly want to help someone. Um, because these areas are compromised through our posture, through our alignment, through being on the computer. You guys have heard me talk about the jokes. You know, someone wakes up after a night of sleeping like this to sit down and eat some breakfast, to drive to work, to plug in their computer, to sit down on a coffee break, to have some food, to drive home, to sit down in the gym in a recumbent bike in the seated chest press, to go home, to sit down and eat dinner, to watch their reruns of Seinfeld, and then go back to sleep tonight like that. That's where we spend like this. We're in a world of flexion addiction. You wonder why our shoulders don't work right because we can't get them up overhead. We must understand alignment. We must understand function. I don't want to belabor the point on anatomy. I feel like I could talk the whole video on this, and that's what the next video is for. I don't want to go too nuts on that, but you must understand it bit by bit and also how everything comes back together again. Okay. So, number two, assessments. Woo! We're moving right along. The assessments, there are so many different things that you can do. Um, we can watch someone's posture statically. We can look at them standing. We can look at them seated. Uh, we can watch them prone. We can look at them supine, sideline. You can go to their work. You can check out their car. Have you ever done that? Have them get into their car. Watch them, not adjust the seat. You know, they've got the ro low rider like this, like they should be cruising through, you know, the west side. Got the fingers up, they're rolling down. I know it's not the west side symbol. I missed on that one. That's all right. We're not going to rewind the film for it. But they're sitting like this. They've got that poor posture. And you wonder why their neck hurts. You wonder why their shoulder doesn't work right. Because what they're doing the other 23 hours a day, what are they, about 168 hours a week? Correct me on my math if I'm wrong. That's fine. But when they're with you two or three hours a week, they have the rest of the week, all those other hours to ruin what you're doing. Go to their car, walk them out, have them get in, buckle themselves in without adjusting anything and see how they sit, see how they move. That can give you a lot of information about why their low back hurts, their shoulder hurts, their foot hurts, and how tight they get and how uncomfortable they get through long drives. If you have the opportunity, go to their work. Might be a little weird, right? A personal trainer, corrective exercise specialist, athletic trainer, massage therapist, go into their work. Hi, I'm their trainer. Don't mind me, I'm the trainer. Be like the guy, the linebacker from Staples that you just wipe people out. Well, that guy was awesome. He used to love those commercials. But see how they sit. They might have an ergonomic specialist at their at their um, place of work. They might not. They might really need some help. So our assessments can go beyond the four walls of our facility when they're in. They can be moving during the gait cycle. They can be transitional, such as the overhead squat, such as the single leg squat. You can look at passive range of motion. You could look at active range of motion. You can do manual muscle testing. You can do specific tests or athletic performance-based tests. But these can, can really help to paint the complete picture of what it is that you're looking at. You're going to look at all the different joints that I mentioned before individually, but how do they work as a whole? I mean, you can do manual muscle testing for just one muscle on the rotator cuff, which is fine. Or you can go ahead and look globally how it's going to work together.
I think putting them all together is going to give you a more complete picture and allow you to service your client, patient, and athlete with more individualization, uh, more accuracy, and give them a more beneficial program. So I mentioned some assessments. There are more than that. But what you have to try to do is find which ones that you can use and employ them on a regular basis. The only way to get good at something is applying them. The first time I used a goniometer to measure range of motion, I had no idea what I was doing. The goniometers have three different numbers on them. They get black, red, another black. I was coming up with numbers with nowhere, nowhere near with what they said in the book. I was like, wow, you have a great range of motion. I was just way off on them. But I practiced time and time again. So whether you're doing an impingement test or whether you're doing um, an empty can test, which if you're doing an empty can test, uh, I wouldn't be doing this to anyone that's in pain, right? That, that's for licensed healthcare practitioners, for healthy individuals only with you know, some of these manual muscle tests or range of motion tests that we, do, we may do. You have to do it on a regular basis. Watch someone else, read about it, practice it, friends, families, clients, even your clients whose shoulders feel great or aren't worried. So we're gonna do this, why? Well, because I'm practicing it. I say it to people all the time, hey, I learned something new, let me try it out on you takes 30 seconds, practice a couple times, especially the people that you're most comfortable with. You'll become more proficient with it, more comfortable with it. You'll be able to dr deliver more value with your clients. But you must know where you're starting in order to lay out a map. So I go back to the MapQuest. It's whether you've used uh, MapQuest or not, or Google Earth or some other service. On MapQuest, I like the MapQuest analogy here because the first thing, you've got the one box that says start with a little, little red icon on top of it, and you put your information, and the next place is, is where you're ending with a little green light over there. But if you don't understand where you're starting, if you never put in exactly where someone is, how can you get them where they want to go? So if someone wants to throw 10 miles an hour in their fastball, if someone wants a more powerful serve, if someone wants to wake up without pain or to play frisbee without pain in their shoulder or just to throw or to get a bigger bench press, how can you gauge that without truly understanding where you're starting from? You must have the assessment piece on the way down, and that's the number two area. I don't know if that's a secret or a staple, but it's in there. Um, during the assessment process, some things that you might want to familiarize yourself with are the, are the GERD. Have you got the GERD? That sounds kind of nasty, right? Yeah, I got the GERD. The glenohumeral internal rotational deficit. So if you have, do not, are you missing internal rotation? You should be aware of that. Do you have to improve internal rotation of the glenohumeral joint? You should have usually about 70 degrees of internal rotation of the glenohumeral joint from this horizontally abducted position, about 90 degrees. And almost no one has that. I've measured one person. I think she was a nine-year-old female gymnast. I work with kids 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 17. No one else is near, especially the tennis players. They're a mess. They're a mess. Why is, glen why is internal rotation so huge? I'm back in anatomy again. It's if you're an overhead athlete, you're throwing. Go ahead, laugh at my throw. Laugh at my throw. I'm a hockey player and a football player. I never had to throw anything. Or a tennis player. I know they're not a true overhead athlete. Or a volleyball player. When they follow through, they must internally rotate. And if they can't internally rotate, it's going to cause excessive movement of the scapula. Uh, wear down some of the tissues that we saw. Uh, it's going to ingrain improper movement patterns. So what you see with these overhead athletes, uh, swimmers, tennis players, volleyball players, uh, baseball players, is they don't have, they need this big arc of motion. They don't have the internal rotation they need, so they develop excessive external rotation. And that ends up wearing out the anterior capsule of the shoulder, which again, you must know your anatomy. And then they just go over that pattern and go over that pattern and go over that pattern. So if you have tightness in the posterior capsule of the shoulder, it can oftentimes wear out the anterior capsule of the shoulder. So if you have that GIRD, G-I-R-D, you must do something about it. You must know if someone has a sick scapula, S-I-C-K, it's another acronym, or if someone has dyskinesis of the scapula. So during your assessment process, you must identify this information, then you can, then you can assemble a corrective strategy based upon that. Third step, tissue extensibility. Uh, we, could, we could go a few different places with the first step. Maybe it's my, my background as a massage therapist that turns me towards this. But if the tissue is not extensible, if it is not pliable, then joints will not move. If joints will not move, then we will have a hard time programming or reprogramming the nervous system. You can do a static stretch as much as you want. I'm going to grab this little band right here. I'm going to reach off camera. I know, highly unprofessional, right? I'll grab this guy over here. That's okay. I'm back. You can stretch as much as you want, but if you've got a little knot or a band like this fella right here, that knot's going to come undone. That knot is not going to come undone. It's going to stay there. It's going to stay there. It's going to stay there. So when we're doing soft tissue work or working on extensibility of the soft tissue, sometimes we must find these little knots or adhesions. 
Why, where do the knots and adhesions come from? Poor posture, repetitive strain, traumatic injury, stress. They end up being uh, these little inelastic collagen fibers that are bound up together that prevent the fascial system and the muscular system from articulating like it should. So if you have these bumps, if you have these adhesions that are in there, we must eliminate them to become more extensible. Now we're not talking just about the muscular system, although remember the sarcomere, the muscle cell I talked about? You can have some adhesions there that don't let those muscle cells stretch. But we must also think about the fascial system or fascia. However you like to say it, fascia if you're from Long Island or fascia. The band of connective tissue, this net or mesh netting of connective tissue that we are interwoven in. It's going to go around muscle fibers, in and around muscle bellies, in between mu one muscle belly and another, in between internal organs and joints, and it's this structural framework together. Fascia is an amazing organism and part of the body, and it's oftentimes underlooked. So we can get this, so if you think about it stacked on top of each other like layers of a spider web, and we just are stuck in this chronic posture, those layers of the spider web can become stuck together. They don't glide or slide like they should. That can affect the length of muscles. It can, act, it can affect the activation of muscles and the movement of joints, and we've set up why all three of those things are so important. So with tissue extensibility, we're not just talking about the ability for the muscles to elongate. We're talking about the extensibility of the tissues around the muscles, those little bags of fascia around the muscles that are interwoven uh, from one to the next and that are stuck together. Um, we could talk honestly for an hour about fascia. It's amazing, but we must address it. If you have restrictions, if you have adhesions, we must eliminate those or at least minimize those so then we can in turn lengthen the shortened muscles. And we only try to lengthen muscles that are short. And I'll get to that once we get to that uh, muscle elongation. So tissue quality, tissue extensibility, we must do something about it. Whether you call this soft tissue work or myofascial release or self-myofascial release, Insert the name of the technique that you think applies best to this, and, and then you're correct. But your tissue must be extensible. After you have tissue extensibility, where I tend to go after that is I don't go right to stretching. The reason that once I get the tissue extensible is why I don't try to then lengthen the muscle is many times a joint can be restricted. A capsule around the joint of ligaments can be restricted. So I want to try to mobilize any joints that might not be moving correctly. So I'm going to go back over here to the skeleton. I'm going to spin it just a bit, but one of the key areas, here's a secret, you put this in your pipe and smoke, and this is a good one right here, key joints that oftentimes needs to be mobilized before you're getting great quality motion at the shoulder complex is the thoracic spine. When we're stuck in this position of flexion, we lose the ability to extend this area. We might be slightly rotated, we might have a subluxation, we might have one of these ribs that are interconnected in between the facet joints that are slightly out of alignment. If you don't have good mobility through this area, the muscles that run from the thoracic spine over the scapula, the scapulothoracic muscles, are not going to be at the optimal length and they won't be functioning correctly. You might even lose the ability to rotate as much through the thoracic spine. Many people have way too much motion at the lumbar spine and not enough here, or it should be the other way around. We should get most of our rotation at the spine from the thoracic spine. We only get up to 14 degrees of rotation cumulatively through the lumbar spine, L1 through S1. That's not so good. Most of the rotation comes up here and most people miss it. So I will come to an area after working on tissue extensibility and then work on joint mobility. Once the joints move, then you can work on lengthening a muscle. Muscle length is great, but if a joint does not articulate or move, the muscle will never stretch out like it should. So tissue extensibility, then the joint mobility, and then your muscular length. We talked a little bit before about length tension relationships. So if we have the sarcomere here, we have the actin and myosin filaments that overlap. If it's stretched out like this, it won't be able to grab on quite as well. So that's a lengthened muscle. But oftentimes we see muscles that are short. They're overlapped, they're stuck, adhesed. And in this posture, many times what we see are pectoralis minor, pectoralis major, latissimus dorsi, the levator scapula that are holding us locked down into this position. So based off of our assessment, right, remember we have to know where we're starting from, we can identify muscles that are shortened. Once we've identified muscles that are shortened, we can then move on to our strategy and lengthen what is appropriate. We're only going to lengthen muscles that are shortened. We're only trying to restore muscles to their ideal resting length. We don't need to take a muscle that's at a good resting length and make it longer. Makes no sense. So we must start with the assessment to determine what is short so we can restore muscles to their ideal length.
Moving up the chart onto number six, neural activation. Now this sounds fancy, it can be fancy, it can be complicated. Uh, Greg Rothkopf's muscle activation techniques, great guys. Um, Greg and Matt and some of the other crew that I met, very, very bright. And one of the things that they, well not one of, but the main thing that they focus on is the ability of the nervous system to activate muscles. And I absolutely agree that it's important. I just like to address the quality of tissue, the joint mobility, and the antagonistic length before I go after neural activation. So what is neural activation? It's the ability of the nervous system to activate the motor units within the muscles so that they can then produce force, reduce force, or dynamically stabilize force. Sometimes there are fibers that are just dormant because the nervous system does not know how to activate or recruit the fibers that they need. You must wake those up, whether it's through using a DMS or a TENS unit or EMS for stimulation or, you know, there's so many different hands-on units, a cold laser. Um, I find even isometrics or working at a very slow tempo like a 422 can be great for that. So you must find a way for the nervous system to activate the muscles it needs and that's where you get the neural activation from. You're not going to be able to produce, reduce, or dynamically stabilize force unless the nervous system can recruit the muscles it needs to from there. So that's step number six. That's our neural activation that you must address. So tissue extensibility, joint mobility, muscular length, and it's usually antagonistic activation after that, the muscle on the other side of it. And here's the thing that most people come to. So this is number seven. This is where people dive into, and this is what drives me nuts. They don't pay attention to steps one through six at all. I don't mean you find folks there, but I mean pervasively throughout the industry, is people go right to muscular strength and endurance. They go right for the ability for us to produce force repeatedly over time again and again and again, but yet we have not touched on the alignment and function of those tissues first. So if someone's on that rotator cuff program like this, doing about 5,000 of these, right? With their shoulder blade in the wrong place, with their thoracic spine rounded. That's not so good. This is the position that caused the rotator cuff problem. The rotator cuff isn't the problem, it's a symptom. So people jump right in and focus on the endurance of the muscles, but they do it from the wrong position. They go after the wrong muscles, I think oftentimes in the wrong order, and the technique is putrid. Uh, as positive I can be about that. If you watch most people performing a rotator cuff training exercise on their own without a physical therapist, athletic trainer, personal trainer, corrective exercise specialist, their technique usually stinks. Great research, I believe Bang and Deal put it together. They found a significant rate of improvement with people who were supervised, a supervised rehabilitative program versus people who did it on their own. That's powerful. So even for someone as a personal trainer, to use to sell your services to complement or supplement physical therapy or work with an athletic trainer, a chiropractor, acupuncturist, uh, orthopedic surgeon, who, sorry, physio, if I've, in, if I've forgotten anyone, I'm sorry, but you can supplement the work with licensed healthcare practitioners, a personal trainer. There's research to support that you watching their technique and alignment can get them better, faster, very powerful, but don't jump right into number seven. Work on the extensibility of the tissue. Work on lengthening the short muscles. Work on mobilizing the restricted joints. Work on using the nervous system to activate the muscle fibers that you have. Then once that's happened, then you can make the muscles stronger and then you can provide endurance. Don't jump right into number seven first. Don't make that mistake. Next, call this a secret. Uh, <laughs> I think people kind of figure this out on their own if they've been doing it long enough, but it must be talked about and that's core training. So what's the core? The core can be defined as the lumbo pelvic hip complex. So if we look at the skeleton right here, they do a wonderful job of uh, depicting the core, the lumbo pelvic hip complex. Uh, I'm going to switch around to the anterior view of the skeleton here. So we've got the lumbar spine, we've got the pelvis, we've got the hips and the complex that they form. So whether we're talking about the intersegmental stabilizers of the vertebrae, whether we're talking, look at this psoas. This is a great psoas. And this is when I work on people as a massage therapist. I go in, I move their organs out of the way, and I work on the psoas. That's just good times. Get on my table. I'll work on your psoas. That's just fun. You don't forget that kind of stuff. But whether you're talking about the global movers, like the psoas or the quadratus lumborum or the iliacus or the smaller transversal spinalis um, or the transverse abdominis, this is integral to this. Remember the lat, how I talked before, is part of the posterior oblique subsystem? Everything is interconnected. You must have stability at the spine, the pelvis, and the hips if you're then going to have a functional movement like walking. As you walk, I'm going to move just a little bit here, Isla, if you don't have to go crazy about it, but I'm going to walk back and forth just a couple of steps, all right? So if I start here and I go to step, 
What do you notice about my opposite arm and opposite leg? Is they move together in unison. When you walk, you must have mobility and stability bilaterally. So when you talk about training the shoulder, you must have the ability to transmit force from the lower extremity, from the foot, all the way out through the fingertips. It's critical. And you cannot do that unless you have stability and strength in the core. If you can't keep your spine where it's supposed to, if you can't generate force from your hips, you're going to overtax what's happening at the shoulder. When you look at a um, uh, lovely sport of tennis, is if you even have a decrease in of 10% of power from your core. If you're missing about 10% of what you should have in your core, your shoulder has to work an extra 14% on top of that to generate the same force. So not only does it have to make up the 10% that it's missing from the core, it's going to do 14% more work from here. And you wonder why people's shoulders get tired and sore and hurt. So this is a, a true secret. This is something we have to do. You must address the core when you're in a shoulder conditioning or rehabilitation program. Must be done stabilizers, movers, the whole deal together. From there, then you can turn to integration techniques. Integration techniques are usually total body movements when we're incorporating the entire muscular and nervous system together as an entire unit. Whether it's something like a step up, to curl, to press. You know, we're working on the integrated function of the shoulder, but stability of the core, and then movement from the lower extremity together. That's how life happens. When you go to open a heavy door, you step, you brace, you push, you follow through together. So whether you're getting ready to put away groceries or to pull the kitty litter out of the back of your car or whether you're going to wind up for a serve or a pitch or a slap shot, we must integrate that back together. We cannot just stay focused of the muscles around the scapula, around the scapula and the glenohumeral joint. You can't just do that. You must look down to the core and then you must integrate all the way down to the foot and ankle. And that's why your assessment process might want to stem into the foot and ankle because if the foot and ankle doesn't move right, even your big toe, you can have shoulder dysfunction and head pain and, and neck pain. How many pitches do I see in Major League Baseball as they step off of the mound, they have instability in the knee. They're missing internal rotation in the hip. They're missing ankle or big toe movement as they come over. And so they have to get excessive force generated from their rotator cuff. And they're on the disabled list with a shoulder problem that's not really a shoulder problem. So they rest it. They ice it. They rehabilitate it. They do all the rotator cuff stuff. They do all the good rotator cuff work. Some, scapula st some scapulizer, scapular stabilizer work. But do they ever address the core? And do they ever integrate that all the way down through the whole body? Drives me nuts. You guys too. So you're thinking like, why, why does that happen? Multi-million dollar athletes, I could train them. You really could. That's why you can powerfully help people with this information. Moms, dads, brothers, sisters, high level athletes or just recreational um, gym users. You can have significant impacts on people. And integration techniques are a big part of that once you are ready for it. Here's the, here's the athletic standpoint. I see this, this area kind of misused a bit sometimes too. In the athletic setting uh, where we've got strength coaches that are kind of pressed for performance, they're hoping that their athletes do their off-season programs. They're hoping their athletes do their work. So I'm not bagging on strength coaches by any means, especially at the highest level, to try to get an athlete who's getting paid you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 times more than you to listen to you when they've gotten there on their own athletic prowess, on their own, their own genes. So I know that strength coaches have kind of a tough walk. You, you think it's glamorous to get the warm-ups and you get to be on the sideline and get on TV, but all the stuff that they have to go through there, it's long hours and people don't listen to them. But oftentimes in the athletic environment, I see this misused. But we must get to athletic preparation. That's going to do with acceleration. We get to accelerate to athletic preparation. This might be the plyometric techniques like bouncing a ball off the wall. I'm not going to do it right here. I go right over the hole in the wall. The clinic does have a little pad right over there for bouncing a ball. So whether it's bouncing a ball off the wall or using a, a plyometric rebounder, whether it's playing toss and catch with a medicine ball, we must begin to produce, we must improve our rate of force production as well as force reduction because in real life this doesn't cut it. This is an important step in the rehabilitation and conditioning process but this is not going to do what this does and we must be able to do that so we must begin to accelerate to, um, towards our athletic preparation so we kind of have to build there over time. We have to take all those other steps first to get there within the shoulder complex. In the last part of it and this is oftentimes ignored. It's, it's the recipe or the program design, especially with a corrective exercise program or especially with a prehabilitation or preventative program. This can be a bit of a mystery is how many sets should I do? 
How many repetitions should I do? How many exercises should I do? What should be my tempo? What should be my rest period? What should be my resistance? What should be my body position? What are my progressions? Should I use instability? It's wide open. So you must understand where someone is based on your assessment. You must go through that process and then you must tweak each of these bit by bit to generate a program. If you've got someone who will listen to you and do anything that you say for a corrective exercise, then you can throw a 55, 60 minute program together for them for multiple times per week and you don't have a problem. But if you have someone who's time pressed, whether they're an athlete or just an active person in the health and fitness facility, you usually have to compress that. You might have only 10 or 15 minutes a day. And that can be daunting. So for you to understand all the facets of program design, all the acute variables and the nuances, looking at the latest research, empirical evidence, as well as your experience, and then put that together in a usable format. That recipe really comes together. And you've, if you've heard me talk before at presentations, you've probably heard my program design um, lecture with the chef. And hey, I might as well go into it right now. I got my, Aleph hasn't given me the high sign for 10 minutes yet, so, so I'll go ahead. If you go ahead and you take a cake box off of the shelf, which is what I used to do for my wife. I used to cook her a cake every year. Um, I'd buy it off the shelf, which is a pretty big, um, you know, pretty big deal for me. I'm not much of a baker. So I take the, Dun here's the trick. Take the Duncan Hines cake mix, but you get the Betty Crocker frosting. Huh? Huh? Think outside the box a little bit, right? I get that. What do I have to do first when I go to cook this? You read the directions. The first thing it tells you to do is to preheat the oven. Got it? I preheat the oven. Second thing I need to do is I must lubricate the pan. I don't care what you put on there. You know, it says lard or says Crisco or whatever you put that on there. Then you have to mix the ingredients. You know, crack the egg, put some oil, put it in the batter, you mix it up. You then pour it into the pan. You bake the pan for a predetermined amount of time. You take it out. Now, what do you have to do? Let it cool, which I never want to do because I want to eat it. Or I'm running late and I try to frost it in a hurry and I rip the top off the cake. But you let it cool and then you frost it, you cut it and huzzah, you know, everyone has, it, has a good time. But it's sugar and it's eggs and it's flour and it tastes good and sugar tastes good. So whether you get a sheet cake from a, uh, a supermarket or whether you kind of make this little Duncan Hines Betty Crocker hybrid, it's going to be pretty good. And if you are new to this, follow the cake book recipe because it will work and it will come out pretty good. But as you get more experience, you start to read some other books, you kind of play around with a couple of things, you realize that you don't need to use Crisco. You can use some sort of spray alternative. You might be able to use applesauce instead of oil. You might go ahead and form your own batter from scratch instead of just pouring it out of the box. You might make your own frosting. You might, instead of a sheet pan, use this bunt cake or make like this pink panther mode or something crazy like that and make some cake out of Twinkies. I got a neighbor who does like Twinkie things. Like one of my friends did this igloo with penguins. It was crazy. It was made of Twinkies. Anyways, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Think about someone who goes to a chef school, Julia Childs, with the hello and the thing and the, the hat and the whole deal. Her creativeness, her brilliance, her personality and experience all came together to create this masterpiece. Now, someone with a more refined taste may appreciate what Julia Childs does. For most people, the average gym goers, they're going to enjoy your cake and you're going to get great results with it. Follow your recipe and as you become more experienced, you will then become your own chef. That's what it comes down to, the recipe and the programming. When you put everything together, then you know how to apply it successfully. So these 11 steps, this 11 part system, and no one wants to hear, I don't want an 11 part system, I want a four part system, because it's easy. It's not easy, it's not simple. If it was easy and simple, everyone would do it. But it's common sense. It's common sense when you put it all together. And these things that must be taken into consideration, you must understand anatomy locally at the joint. Now remember, the shoulder complex is not one joint. You must understand the functional anatomy, the arthrokinematics, the muscles involved, the neural recruitment, force couples, how muscles, together, muscles work together around a joint to produce, reduce, and dynamically stabilize force. You must have the anatomy down locally and globally. You then must have assessments, supine, prone, moving, transitional, dynamic, range of motion, manual muscle testing, sport specific, to create a baseline, a portfolio of where someone is and understand where they want to go, not where you think they should go. From there, you can dive in with tissue extensibility, making sure that the tissue can lengthen and shorten, can elongate like it should. You then can focus on joint mobility. Can the thoracic spine move like it should? Most often, it can't in most people. Let's do this. Quick hands on right here. Stand up, or sit up, stand up nice and tall. And I want you to slouch. I want you to wrap your hands like this. I don't want to smush the mic. Turn as far as you can to the left. Turn as far as you can to the right and do a little shoulder press. 
slouched over. Because this is what most people are coming into you like. I don't care if they're 17 or 73, they walk in like this. Get up tall, ideal alignment, structure and function, right? Now cross your hands, turn as far as you can to the left, as far as you can to the right. Now you guys can put your hands way up, I just don't want to cover the mic and then do a press. When you put the thoracic spine in ideal alignment, your movement improves significantly. Joint mobility is key to functional movement patterns. After joint mobility, you then have the length of shortened muscles. Muscles must elongate as necessary. After those elongate, the opposite sides must neurally activate. You must be able to recruit them. After you recruit them, then you can work on the strength and endurance of those muscles. You do need endurance. You must develop these type 1 muscle fibers of the smaller stabilizers. Absolutely. Once you get that, you must begin to link the shoulder complex with the rest of the body through the core. Then you must put it all together with integrated training. Some sort, not integrated training, but integration, integrated uh, movement techniques, total body movements where you link up the core to the lower extremity to the upper extremity especially for athletes, it must be done. But even if you're going to be picking up your kids, you have to be dialed in with everything, everything working together. Walking the dog, carrying a kid, you've got to have it all going on. Then you must be able to accelerate um, to your athletic preparation. You must begin to build in speed, especially for an athlete. But if it's a gym goer or a Billy bench press, he's got to be able to dynamically reduce force as he drops that weight down in his chest, like you've told him not to do 4,000 times. But you have to build in speed, and then you must understand the recipe or the program designed for that, and that's where you're going to earn your chef's hat. No one's going to give it to you. You can't look at one certification. You can't look at one video or read one book and get that all. You're going to earn your stripes over time. And, uh, you know, the video series that I've got out is The Secrets and Staples to Training the Athletic Shoulder. And, you know, Volume 1 is Anatomy, Impairments, and Assessments. Volume 2 is Myofascial Release, Muscle Length, and Joint Mobility. Volume number 3 is Neural Activation and Muscle Strengthening. Volume 4 is Core Integration and Plyometric Techniques. Volume number 5 is Contraindicated Exercises, Additional Advanced Integration Techniques, and then, you know, a couple more secrets thrown in. And I think it puts together some things pretty well. So hopefully this has helped you think about the shoulder complex but beyond. And these tips can help you anywhere throughout the human body and throughout your training. And uh, I want to thank you for your time and attention, but I also want to thank you for your pursuit of excellence because you didn't have to watch this DVD and you didn't have to watch it to the end. You didn't have to strive to get better. There are many people out there in many disciplines in life that are just getting a paycheck that are limping by being average at what they do. And you want more than that and your clients are going to get better at that and that's why you're successful at what you do. So I'm Eric, I'm Eric Beard. I hope this information has helped you. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you to ILIF, Rebound Physical Therapy, and for Todd Fulman from Integrative Therapeutics. Have a great night.